Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. Among the top 10 best jobs in America, Money Magazine in 2009 named College Professor. We'll find out about a program that's multiplying the number of minority business professors in the U.S. and how it might work for you next on Black Issues Forum. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Black Issues Forum. I'm Deborah Holt Noel. In our nation today, jobs are a top concern. So finding work that provides great pay, growth prospects, and is meaningful may seem elusive. But CNN Money in 2009 used that criteria to identify the best jobs in America. And you might be surprised to learn that number three on the list is college professor. Today we're going to talk about a program that is working very successfully to prepare more minorities for work as college professors in business schools. It's called the PhD Project. And today's guests are here to tell us how it works so you can find out if it could be a choice for you. I'd like to welcome Bernie Milano, president of the PhD Project and president of the KPMG Foundation, based in Montville, New Jersey. We also have Dr. Lisa Owens-Jackson, an associate professor of accounting in the College of Business and Economics at North Carolina A&T State University, and Dr. Pamela Carter, an associate professor in the Department of Management at the university. To all three of you, welcome once again. Thank, Thank you. you. Absolutely. Well, Bernie, I'm going to start with you. Okay. What is the Ph.D. project, and why was it started? I'll do that in reverse. Okay. It was started because uh, those of us in the corporate world were trying to have a more diverse workforce. And as we went to universities, we were finding very few African, Hispanic, Native Americans who were studying business. And even though it had been 30 years since civil rights legislation, uh, programs had been run, but nothing was really changing. We thought, well, maybe if we had diversity in the front of the classroom, maybe if we had an African-American professor, it would attract more African-Americans to study that particular business discipline. So that's why we started. We started in 1994. Uh, and it's a program, really, that taps into the interest that people have. These are people already in careers. Uh, we can see as we meet them and as we see applications that they submit to us, They've been teaching in corporate training programs. They've been teaching in their church. Uh, they've been teaching maybe even at universities, but sort of as lecturers or just giving a class from time to time. But there's something bubbling up in them that they would like to be a business school professor. So that's what we're tapping into. It's really a marketing program. We're marketing a career as a professor to people already in careers. To try to diversify that. How, do, how does the connection work? I mean, how does increasing the number of business professors or professors in, at business schools connect to that goal of increasing the number of uh, minorities potentially in the corporate sector? Well, it, there's a lot of research on the importance of identity. Uh, if an African-American student walks into a classroom and it's a white professor and predominantly white students, it's not a very comfortable environment. Uh, and the, person that the, the fact that the person is African-American keeps getting in the way. They keep wondering if as things happen, as comments are made, can I really raise that, my hand and raise that question or will people think that, you know, th will the stereotype be reinforced? Is this a stupid question? I better not ask the question. But you, you flip that around, and all of a sudden it's an African-American professor, and they feel empowered. Uh, that's going to make that particular course, that particular discipline, whether it's management or whether it's accounting or whether it's finance, more attractive to minority students because, the, hey, there's a minority, there's an African-American professor teaching finance. Why don't you go try to take that course? It increases the pool. 
those of us in corporate America then have a deeper pool to recruit from. And the projects uh, received already a great deal of success. Talk about some of the numbers in terms of how many minorities were uh, in positions with business schools as professors and what's transpired over the past 16 years. Yeah, well, it's, it's a home run. It's a, just been a tremendous success story. We think when we, when we started, there were 26,000 business school professors in this country that were holding doctoral degrees. We could only find 294 that were either African, Hispanic, or Native American. So just over 1%. Uh, there are 1,200 college and universities that award degrees in business, 294 minority professors. And that includes historically black colleges, Hispanic-serving universities, and tribal colleges. So uh, you can find lots and lots of schools that didn't have one minority professor in the business school. Wow. That's an absurd way to, to prepare people mm -hmm. for society and for the, for the business community. Today, we have 1,022. Uh, so we've more than tripled. We have 381 in doctoral programs. We know who they are. We know where they are. We know how well they're doing. We come together with them every summer. So uh, you've really been involved, very hands-on. Lisa, I want to ask you, how did you find out about the Ph.D. project, and you know, how did you get inspired to actually pursue your Ph.D.? Well, I'm an undergrad from North Carolina A&T State University. And Christ Craig has been involved with the Ph.D. project from the very beginning. And he's the dean of he's the business school. He's the dean school. of the business school there. Um, when I worked for General Electric, I taught in their financial management program. And I realized that I really wanted to teach. And so I called him and talked to him about what it would take to teach on a college level. And at the time, the Ph.D. project was just about to start. Yeah. And so he indicated to me that if I wanted to teach on a college level, I needed a Ph.D., and that there was funding available so that um, I would not have to sacrifice as much as you would once have had to sacrifice to earn a Ph.D. And he just kept after me, <laughs> kept pushing to, for me to make the move, and eventually I did, and I don't regret a single moment. Weren't you concerned about uh, the salary potential in teaching? As an undergrad, um, when I left uh, A&T, one of my teachers, Diana Robinson, asked me would I be interested in teaching. I remember saying to her that she didn't make enough money. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going to Ooh. work in corporate America and make more money than her. Mm. And there are some things that money just can't compensate you for. Um, I realized that when I was teaching for GE and the F&P program. And I saw some of my colleagues catch on to things. And it was like a eureka moment. And when you have that with your students, that's something you can't be compensated for with money. So that was enough to get me thinking about it and get me back uh, in the classroom. And Pam, what it motivated you? How did you get into it? Well, it's interesting because when I graduated from my MBA program, I had recently found out that my great-grandfather had been a professor. It never was talked about in, in my household. And so I thought, hmm, if he could be a professor way back then. So after I got my MBA, I decided to try to teach at a community college. And I did that for a year. And it was in the state of Virginia. And there were budget cuts that year. And so last one in, first one out. So I was going to lose my job. And so I was thinking, what can I do? And then a postcard came in the mail talking about the Ph.D. project <laughs> and come find out about how to become a university professor by getting your Ph.D. And I thought, hey, I like this teaching stuff. Let me go to this conference. And I never looked back. I think one of the myths out there or deterrence is that, gee, it's a Ph.D. This is going to be rigorous. I don't know if I can handle it. How would you respond to that? Let me go to you, Lisa. It is rigorous. It is rigorous. <laughs> <laughs> There's no question it is rigorous. Mm. And I think that was one piece that was missing for me. I didn't think about that part when I initially made the decision. But um, the PhD project started, I think, with a meeting in Mount Vale, New Jersey. And there, there were professors and, and PhD students, and they all talked about the rigor. And that was eye-opening, but they also talked about the fact that it was doable. And so nothing easy, nothing worth having is easy. Right. And so even though there's a lot of rigor, and there is step by step, you think you're 
When you're in the middle, you think this is the worst possible time I could be having. And then you move to the next step and you think this is the worst possible time I could be having. But you eventually get to, to the PhD and it was all worth it. What so. is it about the PhD project? What elements within that make the difference? What makes it easier? What, what does it entail, Bernie? Well, nothing makes it easier. Uh, it really doesn't. But there, there are two sides to the PhD project. There's the side where we identify people like Pam or like Lisa who think they might want to do this. We have a conference for them in November every year in, in Chicago, 17 conferences so far since 1994. Uh, and at the conference, we talk about what is a doctoral program, because some people think it's a super MBA. Gee, I'm going to get a doctorate in accounting, that means I'm going to learn more accounting and more accounting and more accounting. Mm -hmm. No, it's a research degree. It's all about quantitative methods and research methods on how to really develop information and, and move your, your discipline forward. So the one thing we do in November is to make sure they understand what it is they're getting into. Otherwise, you could give up your job, move your family, start a doctoral program, and say, oh, my, this isn't anything like I thought it was going to be. So you're going to be researching and writing. Absolutely, yeah. So that's a, that's a big thing that we do to yeah, set expectations so mm -hmm. people know what there'll be fewer surprises. But secondly, the second half is that once you're in a doctoral program, you're a member of one of our doctoral student associations so that, for instance, in information systems, they come together every summer at a conference. So there's a family, there's a support network in place. They can rely on each other, lean on each other, maybe, maybe even do joint research together. So that's what we do. We, 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 we make sure we provide enough information that people don't make the wrong decision. We have the universities involved so that the universities are presenting their doctoral program to the individuals so that they know there's a match on what they would like to work on and then we provide the support network throughout their program. We have a 92% completion rate, which is unheard of. 65% is the norm, we're at 92%. And it's because people don't go in without knowing what they're getting into, and once they're in, they know they have a support system. Pam, I wanted to ask you, what kind of opportunities has having this degree and the status afforded you that maybe you hadn't expected? Well, one thing that I really like about getting a PhD is getting to do research and I liken it to being an entrepreneur but in an organization where you don't have to take a lot of the risks that entrepreneurs do and so when I choose to do my research I choose any topic that I want and I get to choose where I'm going to do that research and so I was able to do research in South Africa and so I went to South Africa and worked with the Department of Water Affairs and Forestry and helped them with managing their data better so that they could better manage how to get water to people. Mm. And so the bottom line for my research was they ended up changing a lot of their systems and a lot of their rules and, and processes, and they're better able to get everybody in the country water. And so do I think I could have had that kind of impact in another kind of job? Probably not for me, because that meant a lot for me. And I went to South Africa three times for weeks at a time, got to see the country that I may not have ever have done that, met lots of great people, really learned things from the inside. And so that has been just a great thing to do. And I know, Lisa, um, you had mentioned being able to stand in front of those students uh, while you're teaching at North Carolina A&T State University. Talk about um, how you've received kind of uh, their impression of you. Can you tell that you're making a difference by your presence there? I think I can. And I'm very surprised sometimes when they come in my office and they see my, my degree from A&T. And they go, you went here? <laughs> it's like you couldn't have possibly gone to school here. I think it gives them the impression that if I went there and I'm standing in front of the classroom and I work for a, a Fortune 100 company, that they can do those things too. Bernie, talk a little bit about North Carolina A&T State University's relationship with the Ph.D. project. Well, you know, the dean, Kweister Craig, uh, Kweister is an icon in business education. He's been the president of almost any association you can think of, whether it be an honor society or the association of deans. Uh, so he's a person I've leaned on right from the beginning, uh, both for the uh, PhD project 
as well as two other major programs that we're running. So he has been a real confidant. Uh, it is not only the best, in my opinion, the best business school in the HBCUs. It's one of the best business schools in the country. I forget whether it's an HBCU or not. So he, his perspective is just so important. His counsel is so important. Many of the faculty, he has an interesting approach to faculty. If he has faculty who are really good, like Diana Robinson, mm -hmm. like Jerry, yeah. who are really good but don't have their PhD, he encourages them. That some deans will keep them knowing that they don't have very much of a career path, but not, not Dean Craig. He'll say, you are really good at what you do. You should get your PhD. And in fact, uh, you're not coming back next year. You're going to go get a PhD. And then he will deal with heads of doctoral programs at universities that he thinks fit what, what these folks want to do. It sounds like there's some serious mentoring going on. Oh, he's amazing. Is that part of the He's mentoring my wife. My wife's in a, <laughs> yes. my, my wife's in a doctoral program. Is that right? Oh, yeah. And he's hooking her up with, with people in Montgomery, Alabama, about the lab school at Alabama State University. I mean, he has a heart. That this is, like, bigger than he is. It, it's, he's an amazing, amazing person. This project is nationwide. Are there other North Carolina schools that are involved right now? Oh, yeah. We have... Uh, we have over 200 universities that are involved. In fact, I can't think of a university that's not involved uh, because they all would like to have greater diversity uh, among their faculty. Uh, they all are encouraging their students to at least take a look at what we're doing. You made a comment to Lisa that I have to go back on. Because mm -hmm. there's a couple of myths that exist. In fact, uh, someone I talked to as I was en entering your, your facility today, she said, oh, don't you have to have an MBA before you get a PhD? See, that's one of the myths. Mm. So let me try to identify the myths, and I always forget Please. one. I'll try not to forget one of them. <laughs> First of all, uh, you do not have to have an MBA or any graduate degree to enter a doctoral program mm. in business. You can go right from undergraduate in. Uh, secondly, uh, people think it's expensive because, after all, going to college is expensive. An MBA is expensive. Universities do not charge tuition. They do not charge fees, and they give a doctoral stipend. Wait up. <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I need you to hold the phone on that. Can you explain how that works? How can that be? Well, it, it's because you know, here you have two people who worked in, in the corporate world. If they then had to leave the corporate world to pay tuition, pay fees, the, the, the opportunity cost would be too great. So the business schools understand that in order to continue to have business school professors in the future, you have to have doctoral students. And they, so they, they waive tuition, they waive fees, and they give doctoral stipends. What was your stipend at Oklahoma State? But that was several years ago. It was. Um, it was 15000 Yeah, well, stipends can go up to as high as 36000 So you can be that full-time student mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and dedicate yourself to obtaining that degree. How long did it take you? Five years. Five years? Yeah. It goes fast. It does. <laughs> And you're, you're standing there. It goes faster when you look back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> At the time, I, had I to, was struggling. <laughs> I have to say, I had, I had one classmate who is the exception who finished her PhD in three years. Yeah, that's the exception. That wow. She was the exception. Right. And after she finished, um, talking to her, she said she wished she had taken longer because the experience mm -hmm. of doing research and working mm -hmm. with your faculty is invaluable. And it, it really does develop skills that you're going to need later in your career. And she felt like she had undermined some of her right. skills by running through the program right. rather too, than, too than taking the time. Yeah. Can I just say mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. about that? I'm when only halfway through my myths. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I need to get back to the myths. I'll come back to the yes. myths. When I was in my doctoral program, my coursework, that was one of the best experiences I had. And it was hard. It was very rigorous. But I think people, if you aren't experienced a, a PhD program, you don't recognize it's very small classes. I had a big class of six. So there were <laughs> six of us in our classroom. And you would sit there with the professor and you would talk about ideas. And you would look at what other people wrote and say what you think. And so you learn a lot about yourself in the process if you take mm -hmm. your time. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just rigor in terms of crunching numbers or studying, you know, papers. It's also time that you get to reflect and figure out what's important to you. And so while there are some very, you know, 
difficult times, there's also some good times too because it, it gives you a chance to kind of be with yourself and, and learn about yourself and, and learn what kind of difference you want to make, what kind of career you want to have, what kind of students you'll want to work with, what kind of research you'll want to do. So there's some very positive things that go on and that's why when I say the time went by quickly, it does actually because you're learning so much ab about lots of different things and you're making very good friendships because you're in this situation with just a small group of people that it's it's all it's a very positive while it's rigorous and, and hard I won't say it's not it's also if you do it right it's a very uplifting and and positive experience too Isn't Lisa how did it change your life and and then we're going to talk about some more of these myths <laughs> <laughs> well I think it changed the way I think, mm -hmm. and I, I too enjoyed uh, my coursework. I did. Um, traditionally, students are sitting in classrooms and they're looking at the clock and they're waiting for class mm -hmm. to end. And PhD seminars, you're having conversations and you're talking about things that you're truly interested in. And the time for class to end could have come and gone, and you're still there, and it does not mm -hmm. bother you that you're there. It's enthralling, and you you learn about yourself. Um, you're right. You you get to know yourself, and you think beyond uh, a message. For instance, I no longer watch the news the same way I used to because part of the PhD program is learning uh, a statistics skill set and economic skill set, and that those skills help you to think beyond what is quoted to you in a newspaper or on a TV program. And you stop and you think, I'm not like everybody else anymore because I'm thinking differently. Mm -hmm. And that's an important transition. Let's hear about some more of those oh, myths. Back to, uh, back to the myths. <laughs> well, I meant to the one myth, undergraduate, Sorry. right in. Secondly, no cost. In fact, a positive cash flow. The third myth, people think 